Well, welcome uh, to our final lecture, at least the final lecture you're going to have with me. Um, so I want to thank you all for being a really good group. I thought we had a really good year. Um, I appreciated how um, nobody was on their phone. Nobody really was on their laptop. That kind of surprised me. I kind of was expecting everybody to be really distracted. <clears throat> and I found the, the class to be on a whole very engaged and um, attentive, and I really appreciate that. So today, this is going to be relatively painless. I, I hope we're going to talk um, a little bit more about how we combine um, stuff, generally some kind of protein or drug, onto the surface of a particle, and then some applications of that. So um, yeah, one other housekeeping note. I'm, I'm going to send out a list of topics for the exam, hopefully by the beginning of next week, which is December 4th. So keep an eye out for that in your email. So reminder that we're talking about bioconjugation. So we're talking about this kind of um, chemistry right here, not the chemistry where we make the nanoparticle, not the chemistry um, where we you know, create some kind of targeting ligand, but actually the, the chemistry of putting these two things together. And we talked about why it's important to consider the use of polyethylene glycol, especially in many of these situations, and why we would use polyethylene glycol would be to increase the circulation time of the particle, increase um, the monodispersity of the particle, so how well is the particle suspended in solution. <coughs> so when we think about a ligand, right, so this is the thing that we're going to be putting onto our nanoparticle, we need some kind of reactive site, right? We need some kind of um, ability to do chemistry uh, with that ligand. So the most common are lysine and cysteine, and those are amino acids. And you know that lysine has what? What does lysine have that is reactive? It has an NH2, right? And cysteine has what? It has a SH, which is also known as a thiol, and this is known as an amine, right? So you might think, well, what else is there out there? There's also some of our common reactive sites um, that we also have some other amino acids that might work, include uh, those that have carboxylic acids, COOH. So things like uh, glutamic acid, expartic acid, also have carboxylic acid groups. But it turns out that they generally are significantly less reactive than something like an amine or a thiol. So um, amines are generally what most people go with because there's, uh, proteins tend to have a lot of um, amines, and they tend to be at the end. If you look at what a lysine looks like, it has a relatively long chain. So here's the peptide bond. Don't quote me exactly how many carbons that is. Um, it may be two, it may be four. But there's, uh, there's a, a fair amount of chain length between the carboxylic, or excuse me, the peptide backbone and the primary amine. And primary amines, again, are significantly more reactive. Okay, so here's a common kind of ligand. This is um, RGD. This is the RGD peptide. I'm going to make this bigger. <clears throat> so this is the RGD peptide. So arginine glycine, aspartic acid, so RGD. The reason this is a C is because it's cyclized, okay? And then it also has a tyrosine and a lysine here, um, which is part of how these cyclized uh, peptides are made. This RGD peptide binds to alpha V beta 3 integrin. And that's a biomarker of cell adhesion. And so um, it's upregulated in a lot of cancers, particularly glioblastoma. So alpha V beta 3 integrin is a cancer biomarker. And this sequence, this RGD sequence, um, actually has very strong affinity for this biomarker. So people have used this to deliver drugs to cancer or to deliver imaging agents. And so 
because this lysine is included here, this lysine has no role in the functionality of this peptide, but it's included because it has this primary amine here, which we can use then to label our particle. Okay, so this is an example of one of these kinds of ligands. Um, we kind of got distracted yesterday talking about antibodies and all the different kinds of antibodies they are. <clears throat> we need to talk about them a little bit more um, because we, we did describe this region down here as being the FC region, the fragment that's crystallizable, and we talked this up here about being the uh, this, this whole structure here as being the FAB, the fragment antibody. And then you will see this section circled in purple here um, is known as, the, excuse, well, this region here as the FV. And here the V is for the fragment that's variable. And the reason that it's variable is because it's specific to different kinds of antigens, right? So if this is cocaine versus mDNA or cocaine versus capsaicin or the epidermal growth factor receptor, it's this region that is uh, specific to your region of interest. And it's done by just changing this, the identity of those amino acids that are there in the tip, okay? <clears throat> So if we look at the structure of this a little bit further, this is a, unfortunately this is kind of low resolution, resolution, I can't find it any better. I'm going to of course post these slides to Ted, so study this a little more carefully. This is a slide number, I don't have the slide number, but you'll see it when you get to it. So this has just been flipped, right? So in that last slide, the Y looked like that, and now it's upside down. Okay, so just to orient you. So FC region is here, FV is here, and then this whole bigger region is the FAB. Okay, so what I want, the reason I wanted to include this though is to show you some of the reactive sites that you have on an antibody. For example, this is a carboxylic acid, right? Proteins always have at least one carboxylic acid at the, at the end, right? Because it goes from C-terminus to N-terminus. So C-terminus is a carboxylic acid. Somewhere there is an N down here, another primary amine um, that we could also do chemistry on. But look at all of these groups. These are all thiols, and in fact, dithiols, S, S is all of these examples. And that's what kind of holds this together, right? This is a, a separate sequence, but there's a dithiol linkage here that is holding these two different protein chains together, okay? And so this is another kind of common strategy that people use to bind proteins. And um, these, a thiol in solution, tends to not be, it does not like to stay protonated like this. It tends to make these kinds of dithiol bonds, okay? This is labile, meaning it's in exchange between the protonated and non-protonated state, but by and large, this, this state is favored, okay? So what you can do is add some kind of reducing agent. So these are um, common reducing agents. One is called dithiothreatol, DTT. TCEP is another one, this triscarboxyethylphosphine. And so what that does, when you, when you add a uh, reducing agent, you push it towards this protonated state because you're dumping more electrons into the situation. So you no longer have to share electrons. Each, add, or each sulfur can have its own set of electrons. And so there's a pro and a con, right? The, so when you, when, you, when you split these, let's think about what those pros and cons are. So using SH for bioconjugation. So the pro, you have many sites. You also are working 
you have a smaller protein, right? This, this is the only area that I need, right, to bind my antigen. This is the only site that I need. So if I can selectively cleave this other stuff and just use this thing, then I've got a much smaller protein and I can conceivably put a lot more chunks onto my nanoparticle, right? Smaller, right? This, this is only, this has nothing to do with antigen recognition. Antigen recognition is only here. So people will take these and so maybe if I could put a hundred of these big things on my nanoparticle, maybe I can put 500 things, 500 of these littler things on my nanoparticle. I could start to add more, okay? Um, but the con, I mean, nature developed this for a reason, right? And generally, once you start adding these reducing agents, you lose specificity. Um, and so once we lose specificity, the, uh, the value of this ligand starts to go down, okay? So uh, considerations there in using these thiols. Um, you might be thinking, well, where, where are the amines? They're not, they're not drawn on here. And that's because you just assume that there can be amines everywhere, right? Just because it's not shown on this sequence, it, it doesn't mean that there's not amines everywhere. One issue is that, of course, there are amines here, right? There can be amines in our binding pocket. And so this is a concern because if your nanoparticle labels through this amine, how good do you think it's going to be at recognizing the antigen? Bad, right? Because it's, you're, you're, you're conjugated through the binding site. So this is another active area of research is how can we be selective for these kinds of amines here rather than binding to those amines, okay? This is fun. I wish I could draw on the board in the classroom. This is good. I want this for next time. So now we're going to go through to be a little bit more specific. These kinds of different um, molecules that we can use to do chemistry on a protein or on a nanoparticle. So the first one I want to talk about is NHS, N-hydroxyl succinamide. And this is one of the most popular and well-established um, reactive groups in, in, in all of chemistry. So what it really specifically does is it binds to primary amines. You generally add this in at 10 to 20 fold excess at biological pH. Sometimes people will include this sulfate group just to increase the solubility. It's optional. You'll see this both as an NHS or a sulfo NHS. Um, one issue, it's very reactive with water. Water can, can hydrolyze it. So once you, uh, once, you, once you first dissolve this into buffer and add it to your nanoparticle, you want to use it right away because it's not going to be good for, much, for very long. So there are a whole host of commercially available reagents that come with this group. So, this is an, uh, a fluorophore. This is a lexafluor 488. So here, this is the part that is fluorescent. And you should look at this and you know, your chemical intuition should tell you that this is fluorescent because it's a very rigid structure, right? And down here then is our NHS ester, um, that the same structure that's over there, okay? So then we would add this to our nanoparticle that should have what, right? If we're adding this to a nanoparticle that doesn't have any primary amines, we are not going to have any reaction. We're not going to have any labeling. So you, when in choosing these kinds of tools, you, of course, have to characterize what's on the surface of your nanoparticle. Okay? So what if you had, you know, if you had gold and you wanted to put this fluorophore on there, what would you do? Well, maybe you could take some kind of thiol. You know that thiols 
bind to the surface of gold. So maybe this would be the first step that you do, is that you would add some kind of thiol with an amine, and then you could label it here. Then maybe this is PEG instead, right? Maybe you have something like that, some kind of group to increase the solubility, okay? Um, the next one is malamid. Malayamid, you hear it pronounced a couple different ways. Um, so in this thing reacts with sulfur, um, with thiols. It is slightly more um, stable, excuse me, one of the issues is this bond is not entirely stable in vivo. Another issue is that you often need to reduce your dithiols, but it is highly selective for thiols. So, for example, say I have this nanoparticle, and let's say it's silica dioxide, and I've grafted onto the surface a bunch of SH groups. Well, these are, these are going to tend to react with each other. Right? This, to stabilize this, these, these sulfur groups on the surface of my silica particle are going to want to react with each other. So one of the first things you need to do is reduce this. Okay? Because this... Um, this group is not reactive for dithiols, right? It has to be a protonated thiol, okay? So, but that's no big deal. You add in some of those same reducing agents that we talked about before, and then you're, you're good. Um, and again, this is about 10 to 20 fold excess. And so what I mean by that is, if this is my fluorophore, so malamid fluorophore, I want to have 10 to 20 times more of this on a molar basis than thiol groups, okay? Not per nanoparticle, per thiol group. So it's a lot. So here, when I did the math, this is, a, this is one of my own projects. So I needed 500,000 more fluorophores on a molar basis than nanoparticles. And that's because I had gone through and characterized how many thiol groups were on the surface. Okay, through a colorimetric assay. So then I can add it all together, and then afterwards I started to put these fluorophores on the surface of this fancy gold core, ramen layer, silica nanoparticle. Okay, so malamid, another very powerful tool. It's powerful because it's easy, because you can buy almost anything with a malamid or, a, or an NHS handle. Okay? Um, EDC, this is a carbodiamid, um, and what that does is it links a carboxyl to an amine, okay? Um, some side reactivity to oxygen and sulfur, water labile, again, you're going to have, if once you, once you resuspend this, you don't want to keep it for very long. Um, NHS, you can, do, you can combine these two together, so this is like plus, NHS plus EDC to increase the reactivity. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to walk you through all of the mechanism, but what you're doing, here's your primary amine containing molecule. So this is a molecule with an amine, and here's your group that has a carboxylic acid. And so at the end, this is R, and this is R prime. And so at the end, you get your product that has linked R to R prime via a peptide bond. OK? Next one, SMCC. This is another really good one I like to use. So this binds amines to thiols. And what it is, is it's just, I mean, if you look at this, and you remember from your previous last slides, this side is NHS, and this side is your malamid, right? And it's just linked through this cyclohexane, okay? So that's pretty cool, because now you can just take something that has a thiol, something that takes an amine, and boop, put them together, okay? This is also very, very nice. The order of addition can be important here. Um, 
Sometimes you want to react with your amine, then purify, and then go and do the other reaction with the malamid. But again, this is much less stable than the malamid, so you always would want to react with your NHS group first. Okay, and then you would purify. A lot of times you can get away with adding that. Just add your your um, R your R prime. Where's your R prime? Your R prime and your crosslinker all in the same pot and let it go and purify. That works a lot, but sometimes it doesn't. And if it doesn't and you have to do it sequentially, then you want to go with the primary amine containing component first. <coughs> Okay. There's also these uh, SM pegs. So this is the exact same thing. Again, this is the NHS side. This is the Molamid side. But instead of this, we can start to put in polyethylene glycol. And this can become very important because these are essentially rulers when they're this short, right? So here, you can buy this where the, you have eight peg repeats and you know the spacer arm is exactly 39.2 angstroms. If you have n equals 12 peg repeats, you know your spacer arm is 53.4 angstroms, right? Here this one is 95.2 angstroms. So this is really fine spatial control if you want to separate two things in a, in a different way, okay? So when would you want to do that? Well, maybe you want to study how does the, this is your nanoparticle, and this is your Raman reporter, and you want to understand how does that signal change as a function of distance, um, or you want to understand how does the, maybe this is a fluorophore, and you want to understand how well does my nanoparticle enhance or retard the fluorescent signal. So this is a way where you can very finely control this distance. So you might be wondering, well, you told us in class that we can, when we have these PEG molecules, that we can form a brush or a chain. So how do you know that distance if this polymer is just going to curl up on itself, right? At this kind of length, it's a pretty safe assumption that this is going to be linear, regardless of the concentration. Right? It's not as if we have to uh, pack these in really tight in order to develop this kind of linear conformation. There's just way too much steric hindrance for this to curl up on itself because you only have 12 peg repeats, right? So that's why you can use these as a tool. <clears throat> what else? Um, isothiocyanates, so you've probably heard of Fitzy, hopefully you've heard of that. So that's fluorescine. Isothiocyanate, fluorescine isothiocyanate. This SCN group, again, relatively unstable in water, but high selectivity for amines, okay? So here we're going from an R group to an R prime, and we're linking them via this SCN group. There's also click chemistry. So click has kind of started to mean, people use it in a variety of ways, but what, what it really originally meant was combining an azide with an alkyne. So alkyne, a triple bond, and then an azide, it's this N, N, N group. So this just looks reactive, right? If you, if you look at these, um, this, these two groups, a triple bond and an azide, they look like they really want to react, right? And they, they do. They form this cyclic structure. One issue with this is that you often need to use a copper catalyst. Um, there have been some, some more recent... Um, Reports where you can get away without doing copper. People have also even done this reaction inside of a living mouse. So this, the, the strength of the click reaction is that it has really high, um, if not efficiency, not success. What's the word I'm looking for? Yield. You, 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 almost every single one of these react with each other. And so you have very, very high yield. Okay. 
Um, so this one then is avidin and biotin. Avidin and biotin, this is not a covalent reaction. So everything that we've looked at, these first handful of groups have all been covalent chemistry. This is um, a very strong electrostatic interaction. So avidin is a protein that comes from eggs. So um, it's, it's involved in the immune response, but you can buy um, avidin as a protein. You can put avidin on your nanoparticle. And then you can buy biotin, and people call it biotinylated. So just like you can buy antibodies for all sorts of different um, antibodies with all kinds of different affinities, you can buy antibodies with all sorts of different tags. So you can buy a biotinylated antibody, and then if you put avidin on your nanoparticle, you can just mix these things together and this instantly goes and, uh, and retains. The ratio is four to one, so you can have four biotins per one avidin. And so that can really increase the efficiency of labeling. Um, again, this is an affinity based. The, uh, af avidin and biotin is just affinity. It's not a covalent reaction, but it's, it's almost completely unbreakable. The KD is like 10 to the negative 30 something. So very, very common. Used a lot of places. Um, very easy, so people like it because it's really easy. Um, limitations are that it is big, right? If you imagine the fact that we're using a protein, right? This is a protein. I think it's about 55 kilodaltons. So not as big as an antibody, but also not not small either. So depending on how big your nanoparticle is, this can start to become a pretty big size consideration. Okay. Um, and then the last one, again, this is an example that is not um, a covalent example, is using hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. So for example, things that are poor, poor, have poor water soluble, solubility, like a carbon nanotube. This is an example from Hong Ji Dai, this group at uh, Stanford, where they took this red squiggle is a long carbon chain, right? So very hydrophobic. And then you can look at this, right? This phosphate group, this is very hydrophilic. And then, so here's their R1, 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 and they're saying R1 is this. This is also a very hydrophilic material. So how do you get all of this hydrophilic thing onto a hydrophobic carbon nanotube? Well, what you do is take this hydrophilic part and label it with this long carbon chain, dump it into a sonicator, sonicate the hell out of it. If, if you haven't seen a sonicator, it's basically like a really powerful vibrating toothbrush. Um, and these will, these will stick to the surface of the, of the nanoparticle. The yield is not great on this. You end up with a lot of chunks of aggregates, but when you spin that down, you do have some resuspended water soluble nanoparticle, or excuse me, water soluble carbon nanotubes. And then you have this primary amine, and so they went on up here and then could put an antibody on the surface of the carbon nanotube, okay? Um, again, this is not selective. You don't have any selectivity. You're basically just at the whim of hydrophilicity, okay? So what will you be expected to know about this? Um, I would expect you to be able to say if, to, to match. So if I gave you a list of functional groups. So say I gave you NH2, COOH, SH, and then I gave you a list of reagents, SCN, NHS, MAL. I would, I would expect you to be able to match these.
right? So this is this is the level that I that I would I'm not, I don't think for this kind of class I would expect you to compare and contrast, but I would expect you to be able to know. Say I want to label X, how would I do it? Okay. <clears throat> so now let's just talk a little bit about the assembly and how we can put um, particles together using these tools. So how can we use bioconjugation to control gold? And then how can we use gold to control light? So I am just, I, I'm sure, I know you've seen this, how the absorbance of gold changes with the size and that gold nanoparticles have this strong absorbance. Yes, we've seen this, how the resonance peak changes as a function of size and aspect ratio and shape and that gold nanorods have two different peaks, right? This is very important, how if we have a gold sphere, so this is wavelength in nanometers and this is absorbance. So if we have a sphere, we have a peak around 500, 400, 600, 700. And if we have a rod, we have a minor peak there and then a bigger peak at, the long, at a longer wavelength, right? And that's because gold nano rods have both a longitudinal and a transverse surface plasmon resonance, okay? So since the resonance in this direction is similar to the sphere, it's at a shorter wavelength, longer direction is at a longer wavelength, okay? I'm pretty sure we've done this before. And so then what you can start to do is to couple these things. Yes. Why do smaller particles have shorter wavelengths? Because the electrons are more tightly bound, right? Because you're looking at how much energy does it take to to be in resonance with those electrons. And so if we have the electrons here are going to be more strongly bound than the electrons here. These are just going to be in resonance in multiple different directions. Whereas here there's essentially only one dimension, right? So therefore this is at a sh shorter wavelength, higher energy than these wavelengths. Okay? Yeah. So what people can do then, or what you can do, is you can start to take two spheres, and when you bring them together, they act like a nanorod, right? These two spheres are, are, so maybe you can even make, start to make chains of individual nanoparticles, and they start to become... Um, a chain of nanoparticles, or excuse me, act like a nanorod. Okay, so you would go from a short wavelength to a longer wavelength. Um, this is a paper, boy, I'm sorry, this is not projecting well. I promised I would show you this example where they used electron microscopy to look at pegylation of nanoparticles. So here, this is actually not peg, this is, uh, what is it? polyoxyl propylamine diamine. So it's this polymer right here. And what they're controlling is the N, the number of repeats. And this is 230, 400, 2000, and 4000. So different molecular weights of particles, or excuse me, polymers. And so the uh, blue ones here are longer than the red ones here, okay? And so since this red has less spacing, these, these two spheres are coupled more closely together than these two with that, this bigger blue polymer. So here's um, an electron microscopy image where they have taken just freshly citrate stabilized gold and then exchanged the ligand. And so what, they're want you to ar what their argument is is that this space between a particle and the adjacent particle is smaller than the same dimension here. And so that we can use the electron microscope image to understand the, the polymer on the surface of the gold. 
And so here's an inset with uh, small, medium, bigger, and even bigger chain lengths of particles. And so this is not entirely impressive, but um, the, the absorbance data really confirms this. So A, this one here, is the citrate stabilized, so without any polymer. B and C are 230 and 400, so the smaller particles. So smaller, excuse me, not smaller particles, smaller polymers. So smaller polymers, the particles are closer together and they act like a nanorod, and we're down here at 750. By D, we're at 2,000 molecular weight, and at E, we're at 4,000 molecular weight, okay? So D starts to blue shift again. E is blue shifted even more. So E, now it's acting like an individual polymer again, okay? So where's the bioconjugation in this? Well, you generally think of thiols as being reactive with nanoparticle surfaces, but um, it turns out that amines also kind of work well too. So as the chain length decreases, you have increased van der Waals forces and you have more attraction. No, wait. Longer chains decrease the van der Waals forces. Yes. So longer chains, more space between the particles, decreased van der Waals attraction between the particles. Yes. This one I thought was really neat. Here's the original citation. Okay, this one's kind of complicated and it involves a lot of steps, but this will be our, this will be fun. Okay, so first we take, this is a silenized glass surface. So we have glass that has some kind of silica on it. And these are polymers that have NH2 on the surface, okay? So there's some affinity of the gold for this primary amine. So here's our gold particles. They're sitting on this surface, okay? Then I come in with this thing, 11 mercapto one undecanol. So this is a thiol on this end and an OH on this end and 11 carbons in between, okay? That's the blue squiggly right here. So blue squiggly comes in and thiol is going to react onto the surface of the nanoparticle, okay? So now we've got this hydroxyl group floating out in solution, pointing away from solution. Okay, step three is we come in and we sonicate it. So we kick, this, we kick these off of this surface, okay? We add some mechanical energy, some mechanical force. And after we do that, we add this reagent here, which you probably can't see which is another thiol and a an primary amine. Okay, so once again, this thiol has a lot of affinity for the gold surface, okay? So then what we end up having is a situation, it's kind of like a Janus particle, right? Where this side has hydro, excuse me, primary amines, this side has hydroxyl groups. Okay, so these are going to have different reactivities for different kinds of uh, functional groups, right? Um, we can control the chain length as well. So here this was 11 carbons, but we could make that different amounts of carbons, okay? Um, so then... We have this particle that is half hydroxyls and half, oops, half amines. And then we're going to add this to a group that has carboxylic acid. So this is now our polymer of interest. So what would we use to link a primary amine to a carboxylic acid? What would be the functional group there? Or what would be the bioconjugation tool? Yes, EDC, and we could have NHS as well to, 
to accelerate, but this is the key reagent that we have to have, okay? So we could dump that in and cross-link these to each other and start to make these peptide bonds, right? So now we're taking our polymer backbone and decorating it with this nanoparticle, right? That's pretty neat. So what's the data to show that this really happens? No, they just did straight up TEM, right? So, and absorption spectroscopy. So here is li literally, isn't this neat? This kind of chain of particles where we can start to create this. And so they're showing it here where they can do it with different sizes of particles. One of the things that's bad about this is that the scale bar is different here. So the particles kind of all look the same size to me, but it's because this is at a different scale bar. Okay, so that's some that's some data to show that they actually did make what they thought they made. Um, the other thing is you can look at the absorption spectra, right? So red here is N nanoparticles only. Um, blue is the nanoparticles that they've done that weird chemistry to. So it's this kind of nanoparticle, right? Not their citrate capped nanoparticle. Oops. So that's what blue is here, is the weird decorated nanoparticle. Um, and then black is the chain. So here we can see this really obvious shift out into the red. So you might ask, well, why does the blue have any shift at all, right? It shouldn't have much. Well, it shouldn't, but inevitably you're going to have some kind of aggregation of particles. Also, you could imagine this is um, relatively positive, this is relatively negative. You could start to have some kind of clustering because of that, okay? Um, what else? So then what did they do? They went and looked a little bit closer at the electron microscopy. And so they could start to tune this spacer, right? This is the non-reactive um, hydroxyl group. So here it was a C11. In this situation, it was C16, and down here, it's C11 plus four peg repeats, okay? So in these situations, the distance they calculated was about 4.9 nanometers, four nanometers, and three nanometers. And sure enough, they come over here and look at high resolution TEM and start to do the spacing between the particles and show that they have more spacing between the particles down here than they do up here whenever you increase the spacing between the particles. Okay, so that is, to me, that is nano engineering. Um, I really like this paper too because they had a lot of good controls. So here, this was a situation where they doped in more of this Mercapto group after they made the chain. Okay, so they made the chain and then they dumped in more of the SH and H2. And so what that could do is come in and displace these amines that were linked to the surface, right? Because your gold nanoparticle thiol bond is not your most stable bond out there. So if you had a lot more of this free small molecule it could come in and displace this part that's bound to the polymer, okay? This is just a control to show that, they, this, is, that this chain arrangement is not due to chance, right? So when they did that, they displaced it and they got these clusters, or not clusters, but just chunks of nanoparticles as opposed to the um, chains of particles. And here, this was a control where they took bare gold, so just sodium citrate clapped gold, and added it to their polymer, and of course there was no structure there because there, there shouldn't have been. Okay, last one. Um, if you've seen, this is pronounced NIPAM, NIPAM microgel. So this is a neat polymer that is temperature responsive, and it has this, uh, a critical solution temperature of around 32. Um, and so what that means is it gets bigger or smaller based on the temperature. And the temperature has, happens to be relatively close 
to body temperature, 32 degrees. So it shrinks at higher temperature. So we move to, to a higher temperature, it collapses on itself, higher temperature collapses on itself regardless of whether it's as a monolayer or just a polymer in solution. So here's a video. I like this video. So on the left is ice water and on the right is hot water. And hopefully, see how it's changing? And so that is it uh, becoming bigger and becoming less water soluble. I'm sorry, becoming smaller and becoming less water soluble. It's essentially precipitating. Now that one goes back into solution. And this one is now precipitating out. So you can go hot water, cold water, make it big or small. So what these guys did is made these nanoparticles, well, they're, they're microparticles that are the size, you know, what are these, uh, half 500 nanometers, 600 nanometers, and then they decorated this with gold nanorods, okay? So that's what this is here, one polymer, Nipan polymer decorated with gold nanorods. And as the temperature went up or went down, you could see a shift in the absorbance. That's what this is at really high resolution. Well, high resolution, these different wavelengths as a function of different temperatures, okay? So is it more, is this better than a thermometer? Probably not, but it is, I think, a good example of nano. Um, okay, so we're gonna wrap up there. Um, I'm gonna post these slides. Rosie will post the video. And I hope this was helpful, and I'll see you guys on Monday and also at the final. Okay? Thanks so much.